Get your advanced copy of my new book, The Body and the Cosmos at NadiaShaw.com. Hello, fabulous friends, fans, and superstars. Welcome to your horoscope for the week of September 22nd, 2019. I am your astrologer, Nadia Shaw. Thank you for being here. What an amazing week it is. We have an active and fabulous sky playing out for us right now. And this is a week that is going to ask for balance, for symmetry, for harmony, even when it's hard and especially when it's hard it's going to ask us to be conscious of the energy that we are bringing to our one-on-one -on -one interactions our partnerships of all kinds as well and that is because there is a strong focus a party if you will that is taking place in the sign of libra now i always think of the sign of libra as connected to due to its venus rulership to what's been called celestial Aphrodite. Now this is actually a distinction made by Socrates, uh, documented by Plato in his uh, symposium, where he talked about the difference between earthly Aphrodite and celestial Aphrodite. Earthly Aphrodite, I attribute to uh, the sign of Taurus, and it has to do with enjoying the incarnation, enjoying being a human being and our, our senses and all that entails. But it is celestial Aphrodite that asks us to seek and to find beauty in all forms, uh, beauty in ideas, beauty in exchanges, but also in physical things as well. It's about symmetry and the beauty of harmony that we see, whether it's in nature or in each other. Libra is a sign that is also connected to diplomacy. Now, I think this is really interesting that a sign ruled by Venus is a sign that oversees diplomacy. And what essentially is diplomacy? Well, it's negotiating, right? It's this idea of exchanging information, exchanging desires and finding some middle ground or at least some agreement point where uh, a mutual understanding can take place however limited, however expansive that might be, to at least find that space can be very powerful. And that is what the sign of Libra encourages us to do. It encourages us to find a spirit of cooperation in its higher end. Now, of course, we can also find ourselves in power struggles, particularly in our one-on-one -on -one alliances. And all of this expression is going to be on offer now, is going to be on display now. Collectively, certainly, but in our own lives, we may find these energies playing out. Now, what is happening in the sign of Libra? Well, early in the week, it is gonna be the sun that moves into the sign of Libra. So happy birthday to all the Libras out there. Now, interestingly, whenever the sun crosses a cardinal point, uh, it marks an important change, an important turn. In this case, it marks for the Northern Hemisphere, the start, or actually the autumn equinox, right? The moment the sun moves into the sign of Libra, that is the autumn equinox moment. And it is the beginning, it starts the fall season in the Northern Hemisphere. In the Southern Hemisphere, it's reversed. It is the beginning of the spring season and it uh, marks the spring equinox moment. Uh, when it is that the sun moves into the sign of Libra. So I find this really fascinating uh, when we consider that this equinox represents and what the equinox in general represents is the idea of balance, right? It's when the sun uh, and the night are equal, when the day and the time when the day is not visible is equal. You know, another interesting thing I recall in my travels, I have been to many different ancient sites and sacred sites. Those tend to be my favorite places to go is to the ancient sites. They're often aligned with some celestial phenomenon. And one thing you see uh, when you are sort of more north, if you will, uh, like in Europe, for example, the, um, the monuments tend to be aligned with the solstices. So the solstices represent the peak in the Northern Hemisphere, for example, the summer solstice is the longest day of the year, the winter solstice is the shortest day of the year. So when you go to Europe, 
there are a lot of monuments that focus on either the summer solstice or the winter solstice or both. They in some way incorporate both. I'm thinking about Newgrange in Ireland. I'm thinking about uh, Stonehenge, uh, one of the more famous ones, Stonehenge in England. Uh, these are just two examples of ancient sites that we see in Europe that celebrate this idea of culmination this idea of what is at its most or what is at its least. But when it is that you travel closer to the equator, when it is that you travel closer to the, the center, if you will, of the globe, you find that the, um, the ancient sites are aligned with the equinoxes very powerfully. And I've seen this, especially all over Mexico. I've been in Mexico now for almost seven years and I know that in the first year in particular, the first two years, I would say, I really uh, you know, went to a lot of the, uh, the uh, ancient sites, a lot of the pyramids all around uh, Mexico. I really, really loved that very much. And I still do, of course, I feel that connection. But it was uh, at that time that I was constantly amazed how powerfully aligned these sites would be with the equinoxes. Uh, for example, in Tulum, a very famous site, we actually see at the equinox uh, the sun rising directly above uh, the pyramid of Venus. And Venus is depicted upside down. And so it looks and appears as if she is giving birth to the sun uh, every single equinox. We see that at Chichen Itza, the most, um, the most visited Mayan pyramid in the world, Mayan site in the world. And it is at Chichen Itza that every year they have a big party <laughs> at the spring equinox especially, but they also have it at the fall equinox as well. And it is at this time that the way in which the sun um, moves and sets, it casts a shadow on the pyramid. And so it appears as if there is a snake that is actually um, actually impregnating the ground. Uh, that is the symbol of it. It is bringing fertility to the earth. And uh, that snake is Kukulkan, is the name of the snake. And it is a very powerful thing to be there. I've been there one year. It is a huge party. I highly recommend it. It's one of those bucket list things you gotta do. So if you're ever around, uh, the first day of spring, or rather March 21st or September 21st, those tend to be the days when they uh, really have the party going. But I find it so, so um, enthralling and so incredible that as you visit close to the equinox, there's this understanding that it is balance close to the equator. There is this understanding that too much sun isn't good for the earth or for us, too much dark isn't good for us either. And so there's this greater understanding of the power of having balance in the elements, certainly, of night and day, and in our own lives as well. And so we're in the season of Libra, right? And this is a reminder, this month really is a reminder to consider where it is that we can approach at least one area of our lives with a greater sense of uh, taking a measured approach. That is going to be uh, something that's very much on the surface for a lot of us out there. And that is because not only is it the sun moving into the Libra, but we currently have Venus and Mercury already there. And it is these two planets that are very active in the sky this week. The most notable connection that these two planets will be making is with Saturn. As Venus and Mercury both connect with Saturn over the course of the week, this is going to represent the awareness of a measured approach. It is an awareness of limitation and responsibility and maturity. It can also be some resistance, some restriction as well. And so you think about our connections with other people, our one-on-one -on -one alliances with others. I really, really believe, and life shows me this to be true again and again and again, we have no power over anybody else. And if we're lucky, we have moments where we feel like we have some power over ourselves, but even then there's just such a rich understanding of the different forces that drive us within our psyche, within our soul, that even then, right, to say that we have control over ourselves or power over ourselves, I'm, 
Uh, there are times when that's more true than other times, depending on the transit that you're going through. But certainly, no control over anybody else. It is ultimately people who are going to make the choices and the decisions that are based on all the experiences that they've been through and how they interpreted it the moment before, exactly before that very moment when you are in front of them. And so people bring their own very rich sense of motivations and contra motivations and reasons for why they do what they do. And ultimately people decide and make decisions based on something very deep and something very personal that we as outsiders, right? We as not them don't have any control over. And I think that's, it's a very powerful appreciation to have actually. It is very liberating on the one hand, right? We stop taking responsibility for other people. It's not um, from that place of, you know, when I say responsibility, I don't mean if you have people you are responsible for, of course, like your children, for example, right? We do our best for our children uh, and to those that we are responsible for. But there is something very liberating when you realize that as you interact with someone, as you meet someone, maybe it's somebody that you're in a relationship with, some type of alliance with, that you don't have to take everything personally. And when we do that, we're able to love and approve of ourselves that much more. When we're able to understand that we don't control anyone else, their love means that much more. Their approval means that much more. You know, when I was growing up, I remember uh, for my parents, for me to have a good job, for me to work was a really big deal. There was this understanding that you should never be with somebody because you have to be with them. You should be with them because you want to be with them. There is greater love there. Love is stronger when it's a choice, not when you're tied to somebody out of necessity. Like for example, financial necessity. This is something I saw a lot of people go through, uh, a lot of elder people go through when I was a child seeing other people who were together out of that sense of being connected on a financial level. Now, as an adult, I can look at that and say, you know what, it's not about the money. There's something deeper, something more karmic playing out there. Uh, people are together as long as they're meant to be. And then when they're not meant to be they they find their way in uh, going in other directions. But there tends to be something more, the money and money often is a symbol of something else. And, I actually do believe that our physical world, the physicalness is ultimately there as a tool to help us to learn ultimately spiritual lessons, to grow spiritually so that we can align with love and wisdom. We're never going to be perfect, right? I think I said this last week, we are never going to be perfect. We are never always going to embody love and wisdom and love isn't always about, isn't necessarily about being passive either, right? Sometimes love, healthy love is about saying, you know, no, this is okay with me or this is not okay with me. And so when it is that you are in a uh, relationship with somebody, right? What Gary Zukav would call a spiritual partnership. That's the ideal, of course, but really any kind of partnership in this context, we're talking about romantic relationships in particular. That relationship is that much stronger when you know that you are there by choice. And when you know that other person is there by choice as well, it's not because either one of you is, you know, pulling strings or any kind of control over each other. It is the choice itself that makes it strong. It is in granting each other that freedom to choose that makes love that much stronger. Now, of course, again, this is an ideal and we hope to get there. We are learning as we navigate and what often happens in our relationships is that we may find ourselves, especially initially, and especially when we first start, you know, really getting to know other people, wanting to date, is that we may repeat certain patterns that were modeled to us. If we're lucky, we saw this play out. We saw people together by choice. However, that's not the case for a lot of people out there. And what can happen is we find ourselves sort of replaying certain scenarios. Um, now this is very like uh, amateur psychologist stuff in relationships, but yeah, that's kind of how it works sometimes until we get to that point where we become more aware, we become more conscious and in becoming more conscious, we become aware of our choices.
really. That's what it means to become conscious. It means to be aware of the choices that we have, to choose our approach, to choose our intention, to choose our response. It is a very powerful thing to do. And it is part of what ultimately leads us to choosing to be with whom it is we want to be, not because we need to, but because we want to, because there is ideally mutual respect, mutual understanding, mutual trust, and a mutual granting of the autonomy of the other. I'm brought back to this idea of Gary Zukov. Uh, he talks about spiritual partnerships and, and he has a whole book about it, but I know in particular, he has two chapters in his, uh, his huge best-selling book back in the day, The Seat of the Soul. That book was a revelation to me. That was such a big deal to me uh, when I read it as a young woman. So Gary Zukov talks about how in partnerships we are there to facilitate each other's spiritual growth, but we are not responsible for each other's spiritual growth. That is what a spiritual partnership is. It's recognizing that there is autonomy, there is your own path that you're on, but if you're lucky, you get to share it with another person. If you're lucky, you get to have that safe space that you create to learn from, to explore with, to, to, to share what it is that you're feeling, what it is that could be coming up for you in terms of your learning, and to get that perspective that you respect, but to have it come from a healthy place of detachment where it isn't that you must learn this so that I'm okay, but rather I trust you to learn your lesson at your own pace, as I know you trust me to learn what I need at my own pace as well. That is very powerful. So it is the sky this week that speaks of these themes in particular. I see these themes written all over the sky. One of them is because of Saturn, right? Saturn is that sense of restriction and responsibility. So when I spoke about that earlier, it's not necessarily that you know, you're responsible for their actions, no. And anyone who tries to say that you are responsible for their, that's not really fair. People make choices all the time. There's a variety of responses we can choose at any given moment, no matter what the scenario is. So people make their choices. However, there is a certain, uh, a certain self-respect that comes with approaching other people with self-respect, with maturity, and with that understanding that, okay, if you're not responsible for the way that this person reacts, you're at least responsible to this person enough to hold yourself in integrity to hold your own self-respect in this moment of interaction, that is something that you have control over. That is something that you can not only be responsible to you, but when it is that you hold that space for yourself, it is that much more that you're able to bring to any interaction with this person that you care about or anyone that you find yourself in an alliance with. But especially when it's love, especially when it's a partnership and a partnership that means something to you, one of the most valuable things you can bring is a sense of self that is connected to integrity, that is connected to self-respect. That and that sense of knowing that you are there by choice, it allows you to love that much more deeply, that much more completely knowing that whatever happens, whatever choice this person makes that you have no control over because you don't control any other choices, whatever happens, you know that you're gonna be okay. You know that you know relationships, they're not always easy. And I think that's part of the theme uh, of this week as well. We are gonna have this week uh, Mercury speaking with Pluto in a conversation of tension. Mercury will square Pluto. And as we approach the end of the week, we are also going to have Venus begin a square with Pluto as well. And that will perfect next week. And of course, I'll be here to talk about it every step of the way. But suffice it to say, at least for now, right, with Mercury perfecting its connection with Pluto this week, this Plutonian energy we're feeling this week as well and into next week, it does suggest an awareness of the deeper power dynamics that play out between you and another and between our relationships and where it is that certain dynamics ask us to own our power 
uh, ask us to transform in ways that may not always be comfortable, but we know our soul is ready. We know we have that safe space to do so. And sometimes we are asked to change in ways that don't feel fair or that don't feel right. Now that is the theme I'm gonna talk a lot more about once we get into next week, but we will start feeling this energy now with Mercury and Pluto, but also because of the new moon. Of course, I have to talk about the new moon happening in the sign of Libra as well. That is happening at the very end of the week. What makes this new moon distinct is that it is standing across the sky from Chiron. Now, where it comes to Pluto, as I mentioned a moment ago, Pluto is an energy of intensity, an energy of transformation, but an energy of power as well and power dynamics and where those dynamics can go askew. But it is uh, Chiron that is a different archetype. Chiron in myth and Chiron as an asteroid is something I spoke about at length in the Chiron special horoscope. I'll try to link it uh, somewhere below in the description. You may wanna have a look at that in order to dive more into the symbolism here. But essentially, one way that we describe Chiron is as the wounded healer. Uh, he was a centaur and he was uh, one of philosophy and mathematics and astronomy and astrology. So he was a, a person who was considered very wise or rather a deity considered of great wisdom and great knowledge in many different areas. Uh, he was teacher of the gods as well. And uh, depending on the, the story, right, there are certain nuances, different regions of ancient Greece as they describe the stories. In some stories it was Hercules, in others it was Ares, but essentially he was shot in the thigh uh, with an arrow and the wound would not heal. And he was in so much pain that the gods uh, turned him into a constellation, thereby making him immortal. It was because of the life that he had lived, because of the service that he had lived, and it was because of how he was able to understand the pain that he had gone through that he was granted immortality. It was therefore the pain that granted a pathway to that thing which made him immortal. And I actually see Chiron as, in our own charts, and when activated as pointing the way to immortality. What is it that makes us immortal ultimately? It's things like our reputation, right? The legacy we leave behind. Uh, these are all strongly considered 10th house matters or matters that are connected to the very top of the sky. But it is uh, Chiron that is claimed by many different signs. Uh, I've heard it said that, you know, Chiron is the modern ruler of Virgo. I have my own opinion about that. Uh, I think considering that Chiron is so strongly connected to immortality, is so strongly connected to legacy as well, we can draw correlations not only to Capricorn, but really so many different signs when we look at the nuances of Chiron. So it's better to leave Chiron as an asteroid, not to have him take over another sign. Uh, however, at least uh, for now, having Chiron stand across the sky from this new moon in the sign of Libra, I think is a very powerful symbol. Where is it that healing needs to happen within our relationships with each other? Where is it that in approaching healthy relationships, in approaching a genuine uh, sense of bringing healing, of wanting to cultivate a healing spirit, can we become immortal? You know, what is it that people are gonna say about us? after we've left these particular bodies and moved on to whatever's next, whether it's the next life here or beyond, whatever that may be. What is it that is going to be said about us, about this incarnation of us, this expression of this incarnation of us? Well, Chiron can point the way to that. And it is now that all of us may very well be thinking about how it is that we treat other people how it is that we relate to other people and what that says about what we are creating and what it is that we are going to leave behind, what it is that is going to be part of our story or a part of our immortality. There's another layer to this as well, being the wounded healer. Wherever Chiron is, it has to do with um, the work that we need to do to heal or a part of the sky uh, where, the part of the chart where we feel like we might never heal, but we feel compelled to go in that direction. And as a result, 
profound healing does take place. In that part of our chart, we are asked to become a healer to others, uh, to bring a spirit of that as well. And so where it comes to our one-on-one -on -one alliances. And remember, Chiron right now is in the sign of Aries. It's about owning our own power, owning our breath, right? having a sense of ourselves as individuals. Where is it that we can bring that most powerful self to be a force of healing in those one-on-one -on -one alliances? Where is it that we can take ownership for where we are in the state of our alliances so that we actually can facilitate a spirit of reconciliation, which is a type of healing? It is going to be this particular new moon that is going to, for some people, bring up wounds as well. Some wounds are deeper than others. Some wounds reach very far. They are connected to us on a level of, of DNA, on a level of Earth. I was recently watching a docu-series that was on Netflix called The West. It is produced by Robert Redford. And it was about like sort of, you know, the, the move west, these, uh, I don't know what you call them, like these, I guess they had a pioneering spirit, uh, these earlier Americans uh, who actually went westward of, uh, you know, within that country and settled westward. And um, in this docuseries, there were segments on uh, the native people of this continent, of the Americas, uh, the United States of America in particular, but the story is similar in Canada as well. And uh, they were talking about, um, like for example, the story of Crazy Horse, one of the more um, famous, renowned, really, um, chiefs that has lived in terms of our modern understanding modern mythology or, or modern history, if you will, uh, and of that time period, you know, sort of the, the early to mid 1800s, that kind of time period, even a little bit later as well. And, you know, I, I was born and raised in Canada, having a Canadian education. And I feel like I thought I knew something about uh, the history of the First Nations people and the Indigenous people of Canada uh, and America as well. But after watching this docu-series, I feel like I had no idea. You know, it, there's just, it just made me incredibly sad. For days, I couldn't shake it after watching this documentary. Uh, it was so moving. And it, it really, to me, spoke of that, you know, that deep pain that can be there for people, um, knowing what it is that you know, our, our physical expression comes from. But, you know, here's the thing. It's not just about the physical expression. It's not just about our physical DNA. We are connected to a lineage based on all kinds of things, right? Like, for example, I'm an astrologer. I am connected to the lineage of astrologers that have ever lived. I feel that sense of connection to them. They are my, my astrological ancestors. Uh, when I was in the academic world, I had my academic ancestors, the intellectual ancestors as well, as I explored different philosophies. I felt connected to them too. And in this way, I feel a very strong connection to Canada. Like that's what I know, right? I was born and raised there. I feel that connection not only to the land, but to its history. Uh, to my fellow Canadians as well. And of course, I feel a connection to everyone everywhere because I believe that we are connected to everyone and everything. But, you know, to learn about um, the history of the First Nations people, of the Indigenous people of this continent, it moved me very deeply. It felt personal. And uh, the sadness, the heaviness that I felt for days afterwards, uh, you know, I felt changed after watching that. And as I said, I thought I knew, but it kind of was this very shocking thing to realize that, wow, I, I don't, you know, I, I thought I knew, but I really didn't. And even now, what I know is just such a, a glimpse, just a small glimpse. And so there's sadness and there's pain there, realizing um, the ground on which I stand, you know, what made uh, my journey, my connection to Canada possible. Uh, was this history that played out and, and that's deeply humbling 
but it's also about becoming aware of a wound that is there as well. And I feel like all of us in our own way, we may go through something like this uh, in our own expression, where we are, uh, again, whether it's people that we have that connection to on a physical level, like our physical ancestors or otherwise, right? We feel a spiritual connection to a particular time, to a particular people. Uh, to a particular context, to particular ideas. Some of that may come up right now along with the depth of the wound, but it is essentially by sharing our wounding that we're able to heal. It was in Chiron allowing the expression of his pain to be known that he was able to become immortal. And that is part of the opportunity and that is part of the blessing now. Where is it that we are going to find safe spaces and safe people with which we can share the things that hurt us so deeply, the things that we feel so profoundly within? Where is it that we can find those one-on-one -on -one alliances where we can really put down our protective gear, our masks, our shields, and allow people to see the more vulnerable parts of us? because it is in those moments when we are laid bare that we are also most honest as well. And we're not meant to be like that with every single person. It's not advisable, right? It's, uh, it's not wise as well. Masks and shields, they're there for their own wisdom. They're there for their own reasons and they can be healthy in their own right. And again, depending on where you are and the context in which you are in, but when it is that we find those safe spaces, when it is that we are able to truly share with another, allow ourselves to be truly vulnerable, to be truly seen for our wounds and all, that is a space of love. That is a space of celestial Aphrodite. And that is part of the promise of this new moon. The promise of this new moon is to be known more deeply and to know another more deeply as well, to put down those masks and from that place, come to a sense of reconciliation or a sense of cooperation, a sense of connection. Now, there are going to be some people who, who take this up and, and want to see this on a larger scale. And there are going to be those people who are going to find some of this playing out in their own lives, right? In their one-on-one -on -one relationships, maybe in their romantic partnerships as well. Sometimes the understanding is our own. When we look at where it is that we have been in love, where it is that we have been with another person, perhaps in a business partnership, those times when we found ourselves truly aligned with another, where it was that those relationships were strongest were usually the times when we were able to truly be vulnerable, truly be seen, to share the things that had hurt us, whether it was in the past or in the present. It is when we could share our fears and anxieties about the future and to find solace and comfort enough to know that it was going to be okay. That is where love has been, romantic or otherwise. Any moment is an opportunity to share love. This was a very profound realization I had actually. When I was traveling in uh, Thailand actually it was some two and a half years ago and that was a really life-changing experience to go to Southeast Asia I traveled around to a few different places if you've been watching me for a while I kept recording my weekly uh, videos from these different places that I went to uh, so you might remember that but uh, I remember it was really Bangkok that I had this uh, huge spiritual understanding that there was love anywhere and everywhere that everybody wants to exchange love, experience love, whether it's in a small moment, uh, whether you speak the same language or not, whether it's in a smile or a nod, that there will always be plenty of love in the world, that all it requires is a willingness to engage others. And in engaging others, there will always be spaces and places where that part of us that needs to feel connected to others, that part of us that needs to know love can find that connection it seeks. I'm thinking of places like community centers and uh, other spaces as well, support groups, um, other types of events that people go through, gyms and stuff like that, right? All of these spaces actually are an opportunity to share love. 
And again, it may just be a moment. It may just be a glimpse, but you know what? For that day, for that moment, it could be enough. It could be profoundly healing and profoundly meaningful as well. Years ago, a friend of mine, now we're going back years here, but I remember a friend of mine, he said, uh, you know, he said, I was walking around downtown Toronto today. This is back when I lived in downtown Toronto. So I was walking around and I just kept waiting for someone to smile at me or just look at me. I just wanted someone to look at me. No one looked at me while I was walking. No one looked at me. Now look, here's the thing. I doubt it very much because he had been a former male model and he was still a young man at the time. So I seriously do doubt that. But my reaction to that was, well, did you look at other people? Did you smile at other people? Did you acknowledge other people? Because it really is, if we feel that the universe is keeping something from us, it is in giving that very thing that we're able to receive it. And wherever it is, this actually comes from Eckhart Tolle. I remember this is one of his wisdoms where he said, if you feel that the universe is keeping something from you, give that very thing whether you're giving it to the universe, whether you're giving it to others, give that very thing. I don't know what would have happened if my friend had decided instead of looking for people to look at him, if he had looked at other people so that they would know that they were being acknowledged, would that have changed things? I think so, and possibly dramatically so at that. So this week, what are some things that are happening? I spoke about the new moon. I spoke about Venus and Mercury, uh, both connecting with Saturn. But here's the thing. Both of these planets are also going to connect with Neptune as well in a type of conversation that astrologers call a quincunx. It is a connection of some surprise. Now, Neptune, its energies are kind of dreamy, a lot dreamy, actually. They can be intuitive as well. But what this suggests is that we may have a moment where we find ourselves going into that place of, uh, of being swept away or dreaminess or hope. We may have that moment where we get a flash of intuition, where we realize maybe what wisdom is playing out here, what could really be going on. Or we may get that moment, this flash of a second, where we find ourselves having to look at our own fears Look at our own illusions as well. Whatever it is that comes up for us, it is part of ultimately that journey towards that new moon, which is profoundly healing and profoundly connecting as well. In fact, I think all the things happening this week ultimately are a buildup, a preparation to that new moon and that bold healing new beginning at the end of the week. The other big news this week is that Venus and Mercury both will speak in harmony with Jupiter. Now, this is a type of conversation that astrologers call a sextile. And it is uh, the type of conversation where it, there's a certain proactiveness to it, where we realize if we do something, we're able to gain something. And so there's this sense that we're able to maximize blessings based on our own effort. And that actually is part of why I think sextiles are more fortunate than trines. So normally uh, astrologers, especially when you're first starting out, you look at things like trines and you go, wow, supreme blessings, easy energy. When I say supremely harmonious alignment, I'm talking about the trines, right? But the thing is that with trines, they do tend to make people lazy, like infamously, they can make people lazy. But the good thing is with sextiles is that they have an action-oriented principle behind them they motivate us not only to take action but also the reward is there as well with the squares the reward may come after a time but it's more like we feel propelled we feel like something's off something's not right we have to take action and so we put in the time we do the work that eventually does pay off but with the sextile there's the work and the payoff which makes it that much more meaningful it is with this beautiful energy between jupiter and Venus and Mercury, well, we'll be able to find the more hopeful, the more optimistic interpretation to whatever it is that's going on in our lives. We'll be able to understand how it is that we can either turn things around to our advantage or use what is happening right now 
towards our greater happiness. And regardless of what is transpiring, we will find a way to make it more hopeful and exciting as well. There's every reason for hope. When it comes to Saturn squares, if I'm being really blunt, they can sometimes be depressing. And that's why it's so important to translate them into action. When we take action, we dissipate the energy of a Saturn square. But it is that beautiful connection between Jupiter and these planets in Libra that ensure that we have hope to make the most of just about anything that could come our way. What I love about this week for us, well, look, there's so much here, isn't there? It's just such an active astrological week, but it's also a very exciting astrological week. It is that new moon that makes it so special and so exciting. Remember, that new moon is the second new moon this month. This is a rare time of two new moons in a singular calendar month. We started the month on a new moon and we're moving towards the end of the month on a new moon as well. That marks a powerful time of beginnings all around in multiple areas of life. Whereas the new moon at the beginning of the month was, you know, energy that was quick moving and lucky and, and overall very joyful, but still practical, this energy it is much more personal, much more intimate, much more vulnerable. And perhaps it is that very vulnerability. It is that part that allows ourselves to be seen for the things that normally we don't allow, that allows ourselves to heal more deeply than we knew we could, that makes it that much more a beautiful time. Well, thank you so much for watching. What do you love about this week? Let me know in the comments below. I love reading you guys. And of course, if you wanna know how all this wonderful stuff this week, this new moon and all the events leading up to it, if you wanna know how this speaks to you in your sign, log on to NadiaShaw.com. Sign up to be one of my superstars. Superstars get expanded exclusive video scopes each and every week, unlimited access to special horoscopes, including the Chiron special horoscopes and so much more. All of this in the superstar space. I look forward to meeting you there. And big news is my book. I have a brand new cover for the book. This is, I'm gonna put it up here somewhere. I think it'll be right here. This is the cover for the advanced copy, the limited edition advanced copy book that is going to go out before Halloween. There's only about one week left for sales. Uh, we are selling the advanced copies right till the end of the month. Then advanced copy sales are gonna close. If you purchase the advanced copy of my new book, The Body and the Cosmos, with this incredible cover, if you purchase it, you get lots of free gifts, including uh, a silver plated pendant, and uh, a whole series of meditations because in this book, I actually have um, every section is like a different sign. And in the sign, I explore the connection between that part of the body and that particular sign. Uh, I was very inspired by a work by Plato called Timaeus and I draw correlations there as well. And I then suggest certain exercises, whether they're you know physical exercises, yoga poses and meditation so there's a meditation for each and every sign in the book and i've made audio or i will be making audio i'm doing that right now as we speak and that audio will be on sale the pack uh, of audio will be on sale 12 meditations for 1995. however you can get those included in the sale of the advanced copy and so you'll also get uh, a note signed by me the book will come signed, but then you'll also get like a card, a thank you card, and I'm gonna write your name in it. I'm gonna say thank you so much. Thank you so much to everybody who's already ordered that. I have a feeling I'm gonna be signing a lot of cards. I appreciate each and every one of you. But yes, sales are till the end of the month. October 1st uh, is when we put in the order for the printed copies of the advanced copies to come in. And those are gonna be shipped to Canada and I'm gonna be going to Canada in order to put together those packages and send them out. So looking forward to that. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your trust. Uh, I hope that you absolutely love this new offering, this new book from me. Speaking of immortality, right? Uh, that is part of what I love about books is I do feel uh, that they are kind of immortal, right? They're, it's like there was something in me and there was nothing and now there's something and uh, it is forever a part of the astrological canon and that uh, is very meaningful to me and of course your love your trust your support all of that means so much to me as well 
And yeah, you can get that on my website. Links are in the description uh, below. Events, I've got lots of events coming up. Synchronicity University, the autumn session is right around the corner. It is starting next month. We've got lots of amazing classes on offer. And so the two classes leading up to Halloween are on astrological magic. It builds on our class last uh, time. Uh, we've also got a class on Jupiter through the signs and houses, Pluto through the signs and houses, and electional astrology, which is the astrology of best dates. These classes were chosen by you. They were based on your uh, suggestions and your requests. And so I will also say, that more people have signed up for this series than any other series I've ever done. We've got about 300 students so far, and I appreciate each and every one of you. I think we're gonna have a lot of fun during this autumn season. And so, yes, session starts, classes start in October. There's still time to sign up to get the whole pack uh, and to join us live or to catch the replay. Uh, and then the last class we have is gonna be a Q&A where you get to ask me any follow-up questions. So I'm truly looking forward to spending time with students online. And thank you for seeing me as some small part of your sacred journey and your learning journey as well. Links are in the description below. Live events, I've got lots and lots of live events coming up for 2020. It is going to be a busy time, I tell you. And so one of the live events I've just totally confirmed is going to be happening in uh, Fort Lauderdale. And so we are leaving from Fort Lauderdale on Sunday the 12th uh, for the cruise event that I've been telling you guys for the whole year. I've been talking to you about this amazing cruise event that I am part of. If you're joining us on the cruise and you'd like to come a day early so that you can be part of this talk and workshop that I'll be doing uh, with the NCGR South Florida group, uh, that would be great. If you can't join us on the cruise, but you are in Florida, it would be great to meet you at this event as well. I will put uh, descriptions below, but right now I am in talks to also do a book launch party uh, at this particular event. So I'll let you know how that comes together as well. My book, advanced copies, as I said, advanced copies are on sale till the end of the month, but my book will be on sale. The official launch date is December 8th. In fact, December 8th, I'm gonna be launching all kinds of new things that I hope you love. Uh, but that's gonna be the official date. And so just a few weeks later, about a month later, I'll be doing this event in Fort Lauderdale. I thought, let's do a book launch event as well. So I'm trying to make that come together. Uh, but yes, there's a talk in the morning on the 2020s uh, from, from Earth to Air is what it's called. And then we are doing a workshop in the afternoon uh, for past lives in the astrology chart. So it'd be really great to meet friends and fans in Florida. I'm so excited to be coming out to Florida very soon. I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. And then of course I'll be on the cruise. If it is that you uh, feel yourself karmically aligned with this cruise event, I would love to greet you on board. I am one of many world-class astrologers that are going to be there. And uh, this event is meant to be a deeply transformative experience. The sky is deeply transformative, I'll tell you that, on uh, just before this uh, cruise takes place. On January 10th, there is going to be an eclipse. And you know, this uh, particular cruise date was chosen because it's under the light of the Saturn-Pluto conjunction. And so right now what we're trying to do is get a telescope so that the first night that we're on board, we're actually going to uh, see from the telescope this conjunction of Saturn and Pluto. And we're gonna do a meditation as well at night under the stars, under this conjunction and what it represents, this sense of, of transformation and change and this sense of power being understood differently and beginning again and what part we see us playing in that. And so that's part of the intention of that, that first day. So I'm very excited. I'm gonna be leading that meditation as well. So it is gonna be under the light of, of this particular conjunction that it's not only the conjunction, there is so much going on in the sky i mean i was just starting to gear up to do the 2020 year ahead horoscopes i haven't started yet i was just starting to do the research behind it and it was just truly amazing at how powerful the sky is at the time that we leave on this cruise uh, we've got the solar eclipse right before and it isn't just going to be saturn and pluto there but tightly together we are going to have the sun 
and Mercury and Ceres, all of this conglomerate together, sharing energy, joining energy tightly together. And this tells me that the transformation is powerful. It is sweeping, but it is also conscious as well. And there's going to be an understanding that we have of how it is that we are nurturing ourselves, nurturing uh, the earth and each other and our dreams and our ambitions. All of it is going to be so tightly wound together that it makes it that much more a meaningful time in our individual journeys, but certainly collectively as well. And so it is such a privilege to facilitate some of this awareness for other people. Uh, but I'll be going on this journey with you guys as well. It'll be a transformative uh, journey for me. And I'm very open to seeing where it is that this transformation takes me. So thank you to everybody who's already signed up through me. I appreciate each and every one of you. Uh, you can find the links in the description below. You pay the seminar fee through me. The seminar fee is going up at the end of the month, if I remember correctly. Uh, so that's something to take into consideration. I believe uh, right now the seminar fee is $250. That's just for the classes on board to participate in that. And I believe that at the end of the month, it's going up by $100 to $350. I could be wrong, could be just $50. I'll have to look into that. I don't have that in front of me right now, but it is gonna go up. Uh, for uh, the actual cabins though, you have to go through uh, a travel agent that we have who's going to ensure that all our rooms are together because it's like this huge floating city basically so we have to make sure that all the rooms are together and so we'll connect you with the travel agency we'll get you connected to the Facebook group and all of that and uh, and I look forward to it I think it'll be amazing for all of us and I look forward to meeting all of you on board and other events that I have coming up in addition to Fort Lauderdale in addition to the cruise I will be in Istanbul the last weekend of March, and I will be in, uh, in Seattle uh, Memorial Day weekend, once again with the NORAC conference. I will be in Colorado with the ESAR conference in mid-September as well. Now that's just off the top of my head, these events, but I'm currently in talks for lots of other things. So. It'll be a lot of fun and I'll keep you guys posted uh, wherever it is that I find myself going. I'm sure uh, to let you guys know. And I think that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you so much for staying till the end. I appreciate you guys that do that. I mean, I'm happy for whatever part of your spiritual journey I am, whether you want to watch the first five minutes or the first section. I do that on purpose, of course, because uh, I want your experience with me to have value. And so, of course, the first part, I just stick to the interpretation. I don't uh, interrupt that. Uh, somebody was saying to me the other day, why don't you have a commercial? You'll get more ad revenue and stuff in the middle. But I'm reluctant to do that because I feel like when I'm uh, doing the horoscope, I go on a certain journey within myself, within my spirit. And I feel like I'm fortunate enough to have you guys join me with that, that it's okay to have ads at the beginning and at the end, but in the middle, I'm a little reluctant to do that. And so I appreciate those of you who stay through the first part where we explore the sky and explore the astrology. And of course, those of you who stay right to the end, I appreciate you guys so much as well, uh, where we get to really share and uh, look at what it is that I have to offer and where it is that I'm going to be. It's always fun. Thank you again for watching. It'll be a great week. Enjoy.